Now, the 2020 local government elections have come and gone, and now parties are gearing up to govern. But coalitions are on the cards. The EFF says land expropriation will be key in its negotiations. Let's discuss this now with political commentator Yanya Yube and associate professor of public law at the University of Cape Town, Kathy Powell, who joins us via Zoom. Kathy, thank you very much for your time. We're at that all-important stage right now of coalition talks. And the EFF have made it easier for us. They've published a framework of principles or demands, if you like, for the coalition talks. Now, these, after reading, I see are premised on the seven cardinal pillars but this time I see there's a time frame for instance the creation of a national bank within 12 months uh, the nationalization of uh, the reserve bank also within 12 months and cancellation of debt in 12 months it's actually quite a, a, a big list but those are some of those now just looking at these one would conclude Kathy that they are perhaps directed or for the consideration of the top big parties that have national presence. They're not surely talking to Herman Mashaba on the creation of a state bank because the numbers wouldn't tally anyway. But these demands are also not too different from the ones we've seen in 2016. Bar the fact that they wanted Zuma gone at that time and they wanted to do away with the nuclear deal. So in this instance, what in this political climate or socio-political, if you will, or economic developments, would see perhaps one of the two big part parties listening to the EFF with a different ear? Right now, none of them can listen to the EFF because the EFF is proposing that municipal council take on goals that municipal councils have no power to effect. But is so it really... all of those... Yes. Apologies, you can continue. All of those... Um, Thank you. All of the demands that you read out are things that only national government can do, with or without a time frame. So to set that as a basis for the setting up of your municipal councils is it's ludicrous. It's almost deliberately set up to fail. No other party could could in honesty agree to those conditions and say, fine, we're going to do those things, knowing, as the EFF must also know, that municipal councils don't have the power in law under the Constitution to make any of those changes. But, Kathy, is it that they're really looking to negotiate with those at local government or they're looking to align at the national government because that's where policy is formulated? Is it not really that the intention is never to speak to local, but to align at a national level? Well, that is possible. Um, in that case, I can't comment on the political viability of that demand being made by a party that has 10% of the power. Um, but it does seem to hold the the viability and the service delivery and the efficacy of municipal councils to ransom against some long-term goal on which there is a lot of disagreement. So if 90% of parties don't want to do that at a national level, it seems a very dangerous uh, a very dangerous thing to be holding to ransom is the running of the municipal councils. So, yes, you are right. I mean, maybe they want to now start talking national now that they've got some kind of um, ability to punch above their weights. But um, I, I cannot comment as a political analyst. Perhaps Yan Yan can help us there. But I don't see the chances of those uh, demands being met at a national level as being any better than they were in 2016. And as a lawyer, I'm just pointing out that that's something that a municipal council can't do. And if that becomes the focus of the municipal councils, then I think we're setting ourselves up for five more years of dysfunctional government. Sure, it's an interesting strategy of theirs, I must say. But then if we perhaps had to be slightly granular, unfortunately, Yan Yan is still struggling to connect, but if we had to be granular and just look at some of these demands, when we speak expropriation of land without compensation, we know that at some point the yes. ANC was on the same page, but then they had issues with particularly the ownership of the land, where they felt the land should be owned by the people, whereas the EFF felt, no, it needs to be nationalized, government must own it. Do you foresee them meeting each other halfway on this, or really the ANC now saying that, in fact, Section 25, as it stands now, is an enabling tool we could use it to expropriate without compensation as and when? 
Yes, that is the irony. You know, the, a lot of the EFF battles have been built around amending Section 25 of the Constitution, but it actually doesn't need amendment uh, to allow for expropriation with compensation because the criteria that are provided in Section 25 are broad enough to uh, to allow expropriation to happen without any compensation being granted in appropriate circumstances. And in fact, the expropriation bill, which is currently uh, going out for comment to the people of South Africa, is based on the current uh, constitution. And it also allows for expropriation without compensation in particular circumstances. But what's important to note is that it's only once that bill becomes law, if and when, the expropriation bill, now I don't mean the constitutional amendment, but the, the bill, the thing that's going to be ordinary yes. legislation. It's only when that comes into force that municipalities will have the power to expropriate land. The moment they don't have that. Mm -hmm. And now just to rope in Yan Yan, I know that you've been able to join us. Thank you very much for your time. To this point now, the nationalization of the Reserve Bank, that's another demand. We know the global trend is that of ownership by governments. It's just a few with private shareholders. But what are the material benefits, Yan Yan, if you will, of nationalizing when some have consistently argued that ownership would not automatically see a change in mandate? The policy instrument re remains the same. It's that of dealing with the repo rate? Well, indeed. Um, is my sound OK? Yes, you sound very audible, Yan Yan. You can go ahead. Splendid. Now, in that case, it would not be necessary, but I think that is not really what the EFF has in mind. I think the EFF understands quite well what your guest said, which is that actually um, it's not a municipal issue. It is it ties into what CIC of the EFF, the leader, Mr. Malema, said, which is that the people who want to go into coalition with the ANC need to understand that they must support the seven non-negotiable pillars of the EFF, of which land is the first. It is fully understood that that cannot be done on a local level, but the point is to do it on a national level by agreeing to it on a local level. So if you want to make a deal with the EFF, you must be able to support them on a national level on the issue of land expropriation before they go in with you on a local level. That is the point. I take it then it talks to that whole conversation by the DA's leader, John Steenhuisen, who was punting the whole conversation around aligning values, because that is also on a national level, that this is our identity. If we don't share the same values, then really there's no need for us to align at a local level. So would you say nationally it's important that you actually find each other there as opposed to... Uh, the, the local level. But then some still argue, Yan Yan, that these are bread and butter issues. Yes, you guys may have your ideals, but what happens at the bottom is what really concerns us. I just want my water. Well, you see, that's the point that the EFF makes, is that it is involved in what it calls a revolution. So therefore, the local agreements must lead to the national revolution. Mr. Stenhuisen is making the opposite point, the one you just made, which is that it's about service delivery. The EFF says all in the greater ideal. That is where the difference between them lie. And it's not a matter of who's right and wrong. They differ on it. But um, I don't think there's any understanding by the EFF that a municipality can expropriate land per se. Otherwise, they wouldn't. I mean, they know already because they've worked with the DA in many municipalities over many years, and they know the law pretty well. Um, it's a matter of making a local deal in order to achieve a national, um, a national point. And the point is also that this is entirely agreed to by their membership, because that is the point that was passed at their last people's plenary at NASREC at the end of 2019. So they're entirely on message, and they're entirely consistent. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Kathy, perhaps to get to the le your legal perspective here on the nationalization. I mean, we know, like I said, it is a global trend that government does own in particular. But then if we look at this particular conversation of nationalization of the Reserve Bank, the ANC seemed to be in agreement. They were on the same page with the EFF on this one, although President Ramaphosa has always stressed that they want to protect the bank's independence, whereas those on the left, even the SACP, <laughs> 
was speaking that, no, 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 in fact, we want to curtail the Reserve Bank's independence, saying that they can't just focus on controlling inflation. What's your take on that? Well, you'd need another constitutional amendment, uh, which is obviously what the EFF is is thinking it can uh, maneuver, um, because currently the independence of the Reserve Bank is protected by the Constitution. It's one of the things that makes uh, South Africa viable in the cap in the global capitalist economy. So, um, being able to borrow money, being able to trade internationally, relies on uh, at at least the perception and, in fact, the practice that the Reserve Bank is independent and is not going to become a, a party of uh, a, 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 an organ of, nas of national interest led by the particular party in power at the time. So I, I would have to answer, in fact, as an economist rather than a lawyer, about whether I think capitalism or socialism is a better idea. But um, certainly if they want to change how the bank is structured and who it belongs to and who controls it and what its main policy is, that's a constitutional amendment, much, much as they have been claiming is necessary on Section 25 on expropriation. Um, I, uh, thinking now of your earlier question, which I did not answer, which is about whether expropriation should result in the state owning the land or whether the land would then be passed on to the people who don't have it. Um, yes. Should it be the former, yes. that the, the, this land now actually becomes the property of the state, then I think unless the Constitution is amended, Section 25, um, that, that would be unconstitutional. Because Section 25, while it provides for land reform uh, and land restitution and redistribution, also protects property rights. Mm -hmm. So to simply wipe out all property rights and make everything the property of the state, that would require a more extensive constitutional amendment than is currently proposed. You touch on a very important fact, global perception. We're not living on an island here. We cannot be very insular in how mm -hmm. we conduct ourselves as a country. The perception around the expropriation of land without compensation, should it go ahead? Should we be fearful of uh, perhaps the World Bank or the IMF thinking that you have a South Africa here that is going to now disregard property rights and again even on the nationalization, global perception? Should we really be concerned with yes. that or we need to deal with redress? that you've got to start at home and address the past injustices. And then beyond that, as a united front as a country, we position ourselves and say, this is us, you can do business with us. Look, any country that, that imports all its petrol uh, is dependent on global perception. Uh, we don't even need to talk about the IMF or the World Bank. Um, we are part of a network. We can't suddenly pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. So, yes, global perception is extremely important. And the other thing that matters is whether foreign investors are going to feel safe investing in, in the country, because that's one of the entities that creates jobs. Um, and if, uh, if the expropriation provisions seem to grant too much power in the executive and leave too much to unannounced and, and um, undefended policy changes, then that's another, that's another win of the global community that you're scaring off. So I, I think that redress is supposed to happen within the framework of a functioning state. And given South Africa's current debt, and given the petrol that we use, and given the way we have to work within the current global economy, I don't think um, there is too much that we can, yeah, that we can threaten or in our economic relationships. But again, I, I must. I must add, that would be me speaking as an economist, and I'm not one. Uh, let me just say that the Constitution, as it currently stands, tries to keep a balance uh, so that redress is happening within a framework that mm -hmm. keeps the country viable internationally. But we keep hearing and, some and commentators. Uh, apologies, you can continue? Karina? You can continue, Cathy? Thank you. I, I just want to add one more thing. The moment the Constitution is often blamed that land restitution and ref reform has been so slow, uh, I think it's clear, even from the latest 
uh, constitutional amendments that have been proposed and the latest expropriation bill, that the problem is not in the constitutional framework or the legislation. The problem is in the implementation of that. And there's no guarantee by changing those rules that you're going to get the expropriation process to work any better than it's working now. So I, I, I think that needs to be done, and it could, in fact, be done within a framework that is friendly to the global economy. Mm -hmm. I just heard you speaking of the functional state. I mean, would we not argue that yeah. also, if you're looking to be outward looking, uh, if that is even a term, but if you're going to be outward looking, where you're looking to appease the global world at the expense of citizens within the country where we neglect redress, we could also have a problem similar to the unrest we saw, because many said that was indicative of a broader problem of inequality as a result of even our economic policies around capitalism. I agree with you that we have a huge problem with inequality. Whether it's caused by capitalism per se, I cannot say, but I know that contributing factors are corruption and maladministration. All things that the local municipal elections were clearly supposed to start fixing. Uh, and it is possible that those sorts of things can be fixed without making huge changes to the economic system. But again, I mean, I would be interested to hear what Yan Yan says about this because I, I do not speak as an economist. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm just saying that, be, you know, it's not just capitalism that is the problem in this case. No, certainly. It's a broader situation. Uh, Yan Yan, your take, perhaps just to take you a bit back, thank you for joining us again. Uh, if we talk nationalization here of the Reserve Bank, many are concerned or of the view that perhaps what we're see these, some of these political parties are seeking to do is to influence the monetary policy. But some could say if the intention is, in fact, to influence monetary policy, it could still be done now because government is still appointed, I mean, the governor, rather, is still appointed by government. Quite right. And um, we'll have to see how it plays out. We must remember, we must lose focus here. This is about coalition negotiations, and they must be concluded within nine days now that the uh, results have been verified by the IEC. So there's a clock ticking. The, the question before the ANC is whether they are happy to um, give way on their policy in order to get power. And the EFF of all people, and this, this is the party that you are referring to as the one speaking of... Um, of the privatization of the Reserve Bank and of the expropriation of land without compensation. In fact, the wholesale nationalization of land. Mm -hmm. um, the ANC has to make a choice. And the ANC is in a lose-lose situation because were they to not agree to the EFF's terms, they will lose power. And all those uh, people who were benefiting from power, um, all those privileges that they had would be lost. But on the other hand, if they were to agree to EFF policy, they would be isolating Mr. Ramaphosa, who clearly opposes it. And this is the problem with politics. And that, I think, is why Mr. Malema was in such a good mood when he was speaking at the ROC, at the results uh, center, because he knew he had the ANC in a complete bind. And I can assure you that within the ANC on every level, be it local, provincial or national, a massive fight is on the way because people stand to win and people stand to lose personally. Sure, Yan Yan, this is a very difficult one. I mean, when you talk on policy, it, it really begs the question, what is power if you're not going to formulate your own policy? Because right now, if they were to accede to any of these demands, it would be a case of you have another political party now that's going to formulate, formulate your policy. Because if we're talking nationalization, it wouldn't be theirs. But then again, I asked the question earlier that is the social, political and economic climate perhaps warranting uh, the ANC to see this with a different set of eyes because they have dropped significantly. Maybe they have no choice. Indeed. And you're taking the longer view. What I'm saying is that the clock is ticking. Those patronage networks which enabled the corruption which the ANC now has to undo those patronage networks are not interested in policy. They're interested in power. So I think the ANC is getting it from two sides. The EFF knows only too well 
that the ANC has never been weaker. This is not a personal opinion, at least not since the dawn of democracy has the ANC been weaker. The facts show us, the figures show us, the very drop that you've just referred to shows us that uh, the ANC is in the worst position it's ever been. Now is the time for the EFF to pounce if they want to eat the elephant, as Mr. Malema said. That was exactly his coding. So the ANC is in a terrible position where they lose either way. Their patronage networks must be all over them. And those patronage networks are not nice people who play by the rules. These are people you don't want angry at you. And they are angry and they are fearful because they might well end up in different circumstances than they are now even legally. Mm -hmm. by which I'm saying some of them might be going to jail. So there's a lot of pressure on the ANC at this stage to acquiesce the EFF. The EFF knows it. This is why they're putting in this massive play right now for the ANC to move to their positions, knowing full well that many in the ANC agree with them with ex on expropriation without compensation. The ANC has always been divided on this issue, and they know it. So they are pouncing. At the same time, the DA has closed the door on negotiations with the ANC, so the ANC is between the devil and the deep blue sea, and you can choose which is which. And they have almost nowhere to go except opposition, in which case those patronage networks are going to be very unhappy. It's funny, though, how when you speak, we almost think, or all of us assume, that they're really putting these demands to the ANC. Do you see no position for them to negotiate with the Democratic Alliance at this point? The That's EFF, the EFF, no, yes. The Democratic Alliance has already said no. Sure, but, you know, numbers have changed. We never know. But then to this one, more of, of their demands. They're talking about the removal of uh, the stem. I know many have argued before that it possibly should have been long gone along with its visual equivalent, which is the apartheid flag. What's your take of the removal of the stem? Because I know it, it is an emotive subject, particularly because of the Afrikaans element, where I guess there's no grouping in society that would want you to do away with their language. But if it is part of the apartheid anthem and there have been those calls that that is an easy one you can do away and perhaps bring afrikaans again but have uh, a new set uh, something else written into the, the the national anthem and even if you want we could be so progressive as to have sign i mean i'd love to see uh, our our boys out in certain countries singing and then we just have instruments and they have sign language as a, an, an official language which we should recognize Oh, that is an opinion I may or may not share. Luckily, neither you nor I are negotiating. So the point is not what we would like. The point is what's going to happen in those negotiations. Um, I'm not entirely sure. Look, the current ANC position, very firm position thus far, has been that they um, support the whole anthem as is, unwieldy as it might seem in its four linguistic um, parts. But they do support it. I don't think that's really... At the core of the matter. I mean, I think that's one of the easier points. The point is that the, ANC, uh, the EFF says you buy the whole package or you get nothing. So, quite frankly, you can start with land, which is the most difficult one. Um, and if they can agree on that, which would mean Mr. Ramaphosa would have to eat a massive pie on which is written humble, um, mm. then you can start negotiating on the other six on the other demands as well, which would include the STEM. But I don't think the STEM is top of mind at the moment. And as I say, neither your, your opinion nor mine would sway it because we are not on the negotiating teams. No, certainly. Just in closing, Cathy, uh, for you, the demand on the exclusivity or rather the demand to exclusively govern. The EFF said they'd accept, I remember listening to them, they said they'd accept that uh, the citizens aren't ready for them to govern. They saw the numbers. But here they are. I don't know if I'm, I'm misunderstanding what they said. Here they are. They have a demand to exclusively govern if they're going to vote with uh, opposition in certain, uh, in certain municipalities. What do you make of, of that? It's a flat contradiction. Um, and it is not democratic. If you have a party that's got 10% of the vote, you know, well done, they've improved on their previous score, great. But it does not mean that you have majority democratic support. And I, I noticed in their list of demands, they want to govern some municipalities exclusively, and then they'll give up on others, like there's some sort of horse trading between them and the other parties. You know, I'll take Cape Town, you take this one. Uh, not that Cape Town's up for grabs, but, you know, they, they want to 
parcel out the municipalities that are hung. Now, that is a huge insult to the electorate. Um, the electorate in each of those municipalities, roughly 10% chose the EFF, another group chose another party, another group chose another party. They need to be represented in the municipal council that gets formed. So it's double speak on the EFF's part to say, we, we know we're not ready to govern, but now we're going to govern. Um, and it's profoundly undemocratic and it's unconstitutional. So um, um, if such an arrangement would, were to be made, it could only be made behind the scenes. And that is not transparent either. So I, I, I think that that demand is a bad sign for our democracy. And, and I, I must say this using municipal councils as a hostage for, for national policy also makes me nervous because I thought the whole point of these councils of the elections was to try and get the councils moving. People are struggling. People have sewage running through their streets. Um, so, yes, I, I don't think these demands all go well for our coalition governments. Mm -hmm. I must say, though, just in their defense, they have spoken of the provision of water. They have those of, of, as demands and want certain timelines. But, Yanya, -Yan, just to give you an opportunity to close there, your take on, on this demand to exclusively lead some municipalities, is it not perhaps them seeking uh, an opportunity to show what they can do? Yes, it is. And I'm in the incredibly difficult position that I'm disagreeing with Cathy, who's much smarter than I. But um, maybe <laughs> politicians are not quite as legally pure as those who work in law. So I would um, firmly say that this has been the EFS position, and it almost happened last year. Last year, for all intents and purposes, and stripped of all veneer, what the EFF said and the ANC agreed to on a national level, as far as I understand, was that the ANC gets to govern Johannesburg and the EFF gets to govern Tuani. Then the um, ANC caucus in Tuani rebelled and refused to vote for the EFF to run the city by itself. And that is the only way in which that was prevented. So that's been a long-standing view of the EFF. And much as it may be true that it would be preferable to see 100% or 90% or 10% or however many people represented in the governance of a political um, entity, such as a city council, a metro council, a town council, that is not what the executive mayoral system makes provision for. The only province in which it works in the way that Cathy was, um, was speaking is KwaZulu-Natal. That's an old legacy of the IFP, who had a more inclusive system um, adopted when they first took power after 94 in KwaZulu-Natal, where political parties already are represented on a proportional basis in the um, mayoral system. But unfortunately, um, it's up to the ANC and the EFF if they want to divvy out these councils, if they want to give some to the ANC, some to the EFF, um, where it's in their power so that they can have a national agreement. When that, well, that, that will happen because the system allows for it. In such a case, the EFF will be the silent partner being quiet but voting with the ANC and some councils and the ANC would be the silent partner of the EFF, EFF in charge and other councils. It's all up to the negotiations, which none of us can foresee, but it's fascinating to know the possibilities. Sure, it certainly is. I've thoroughly enjoyed the conversation with the both of you. Thank you very much. That's political commentator Yan Yan Yube and Associate Professor of Public Law at the University of Cape Town, Cathy Powell. Thanks again. I hope the other political parties will publish their demands and we unpack them here and see what's possible. Now, still to come on.